Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Monroe Review, where it's all about connecting, sharing, and valuing the arts in the central San Joaquin Valley. I'm Donald Monroe. Today is December 9th, and we are in the CMAX studio, still slowly getting our way back to pre-pandemic life. I can tell you it's great to be back. On today's show, we have some really fine guests. We go on location to talk with Aidan Pertel, a promising 16-year-old Fresno pianist who will perform for keyboard concerts. And it is Second Space Day at the Monroe Review. We will check in on the current holiday show and preview the next one. But first, let's recap some of what I've been covering at MonroeReview.com. Fresno actor Mark Standriff has been in 17 productions of A Christmas Carol over his long career. He played every male character except the one you're most likely to think of. In his 18th version of the Dickens classic, he got to play, you guessed it, Scrooge. This Fresno City College Theater production is a radio play with Standriff and a talented cast recreating one of those cozy 1940s productions complete with sound effects. You might have caught a live performance of it at the college's recent holiday fair. Director Janine Crystal also came up with another way for you to experience it. The radio version will be playing on KYNO 940 AM on the following dates, 4 p.m. December 19th and 7 p.m. December 23rd. Those of you who have seen Standriff on stage know what a glorious, resonant voice he has, and he gives his Scrooge performance a distinctive air. In my interview with him, which you can read on MonroeReview.com, he talks about why A Christmas Carol is so important to him, including the fact that he met his wife in one of his productions. Another story not to miss. We've heard from legions of theater writers and fans about the impact of Stephen Sondheim, whose death on November 26th sent the Broadway world into a tailspin. Instead of writing another tribute, I decided instead to ask some local theater folks and fans a question. What is your favorite Sondheim lyric and why? I, can, I got some great answers, and maybe we can ask some of our in-studio guests that question as well. Also at MonroeReview.com, in recent stories, I had a wonderful time interviewing Glee star Chris Colfer about his appearance with a special Good Company Players Gala event. I also offered 10 Things to Love about Selma Art Center's Zoot Suit. I gave you updates on California Opera and the Fresno Philharmonic. And look for a special video interview with ceramicist Garrett Masterson, whose works are in a terrific show at Clay Mix Gallery. Now, let's get to our first guests. Brian Beckstrand and Tracy Hostmeyer play the parents in the Good Company Players production of Months on End, which opens January 7th at the Second Space Theater. This play is described as a year's worth of happiness and heartbreak fused <laughs> into one compelling story. Welcome, Brian and Tracy. Thanks for being Thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got a year worth of, of stuff going on. Is, what, what, what does that mean? Well, the, there's a, a small collection of people who are uh, t connected in one way or another. We're the parents of, of two daughters who appear in the show, and then they're their friends. Um, and the show really concentrates on relationships. And, um, you know, the, the marriage relationship, the sibling relationship, brothers, sisters, friends. Um, boyfriends, parents. however you define them. Yeah, <laughs> boyfriends, however you define them, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, and each um, each scene of the show is a different month of the year. So it begins in January and it finishes in December. So you, you get to experience a year in the lives of these characters. Interesting structure. That's, yeah. That's a, an interesting way of doing it. So you, your parents, and are you connected to all of the characters or? No. 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 But, or, or you have kids then who... Yeah, w there is a wedding that you don't see the wedding, but there is a wedding uh, moment in the show, and I think uh, most of the characters are at that wedding, so we, we um, cross paths with each other, but our main relationship is with our two daughters in the show. Okay, okay. So, Brian, tell us about your character. His, uh, <clears throat> his name is Chris. Um, and he's a very he's a down to earth character. Uh, if he if he had an element that he'd be a, uh, associated with, it'd be earth. He's touchy feely. He's kind. Um, 
and which is the opposite of Trace's character, Gwen. <laughs> so I think they play well off together, both at home and uh, as so characters So opposites in life. really did attract in this. S somehow, in this yes. yeah, I think so. Uh, and I understand, Brian, that you're a little more reserved in in yes. real life than your character. I'm, so has that been a challenge for you? It has been. I'm not terribly touchy feely. <laughs> um, so it's it's a it's a challenge to sort of bring try to bring that out. I'm looking forward to it. Um, to well, that's sort of one explore of the that. great things about acting, right? Yeah, because you get to kind of explore those those other sides. People yeah. now, not. Tracy. It sounds like your character is a little bit more on the, the well. I'm not high powered. unkind. Okay, but <laughs> <laughs> but she is she is a little brassy. And she's this is a, set in New York City. So yeah, so she's kind of your you typical think brassy. Of that, yeah. You know, a little bit controlling. I think her kids think she's very controlling, overbearing mom, like a helicopter mom. Okay. But I think she just, deep down, just really loves her children and wants what's best for them. And what's best for them just happens to be what I think is best for them. It's kind of like that. <laughs> These are, uh, this, this type of show is oftentimes a lot of fun for audiences because it sort of gives you this whole constellation of characters That's that you kind of you kind of dip into and I, I am guessing because I haven't I haven't uh, seen the show before but I'm guessing there's a lot of of interesting developments that that occur between these characters yes 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 <laughs> and we're not going to tell you what any of them are you have to come and see the show it's, exactly <laughs> um, is is it uh, fun to be in a show like that that has a lot of characters and mm -hmm. you, you must have a lot of, of interesting interactions backstage as well? Well, we haven't opened yet, so we don't know what that's going to be like. That's true. But that's um, true. in rehearsal, it's been wonderful. I mean, we, we, we're at the point now where we're running the whole show, and it's wonderful to sit and see you know, all these other um, scenes developing and relationships developing, and we're the older actors in the show, and it's great to see these young, younger, I, I shouldn't call them kids, but they feel like kids, some of them. Well, two of them are our kids in the yeah, show. Yeah, I mean, so. technically, but I mean, just watching these young actors is really lovely. So, Tracy, I understand this is your first Second Space show since... 1990. 1990. That's yeah. a that's a a pretty a pretty big gap. And what show was that? It was Le Les en Dangereux, and um, directed by Biz Feaster. Um, yeah, it had a wonderful cast, incredible costumes. Um, I loved doing that show so much. I loved it. I had so much fun. Does the second space seem like it's changed much, or did you walk back in and say? It's just like it was before. It is just like it was before, and um, yeah, but it, it's still, it's, um, I did have to ask where the restroom was when I first got to where <laughs> I was. I was like, where, where is it again? I don't remember. Um, so, but other than that, yeah, it's the same, and some of the same people, I see some of the same people that, um, you know, were around when I was around. Um, I think G GCP in general is like that. It's like a family. Um, so you can kind of, you know, leave for 20 years, come back, and kind of pick up where you left off. And you had some interesting, you've had some interesting adventures since yes. that 1990. You moved to New York. Uh, uh, well, I, first I moved to London, and then I lived in L.A. for a little while, and then I moved to New York, and that's where I met you. And um, I, was, I was covering uh, the play Yonka, mm -hmm. which uh, Janice Noga put together, and you... Uh, My company produced your that company production produced in New York. Yes. And I understand that Janice has actually made a, a movie version of it. That's she has. That's going to be coming out. She has. But that was great fun. That trip to New York, I got to take, um, to report on that story. Because <laughs> a lot of people in Fresno A lot of people from Fresno it. came out. They helped pay for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's one of the wonderful things about the theater community in Fresno, is that they are really supportive of the Fresno people. Yeah. Yeah. So, Brian, where would we have seen you on stage before? I've been in several uh, shows, both at Second Space Theater and Roger Rocca's. Um, I, one of the one of my favorite was Detective Story from years ago, directed by Nancy Miller. I remember um, that one. Yeah, that was, was really. It good. was such Nancy a fun Miller. show. I could have done that show forever. Um, and one that you reviewed me in that I really appreciated was. Uh, 
It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play directed by uh, Denise Graziani, uh, where I was Uncle Billy. And that was such a fun character and a role to do. And those radio shows are so fun to watch. They, they really are. Um, just, it makes me wish that we did more of those, that kind of thing today. Yeah. You know, everything's so high tech and special effects. And mm. it's, it's kind of fun that, you know, when you take like styrofoam and crunch it together. <laughs> <laughs> That makes this. What I really wanted to do with that show is be the Foley artist. Oh, right, right. Because I want to be the guy making the noise. Right. So <laughs> your so show, cool. Months on End, mm -hmm. uh, it opens January 7th. It does. Um, it sounds kind of like a cozy show, maybe a, like kind of a nice winter uh, type of show. You can yeah. kind of burrow into it and yeah. get and into it, the story. It's, um, it's relatively short in time. Um, there's a little intermission in the middle, but but it's not, it's a great night out at the theater because you can come and you're not out too late and you can ha you know, have a little dinner before. It's a great date um, show for those of you who are dating out there. <laughs> well, it's, it sounds like, like a real treat and that plays through February 27th. February 27th, So people yeah. have a nice chunk of time, but I always tell people you've got to plan this stuff out because you'll say to yourself, I really want to go see that, and then you'll realize that two months have slipped by. Yeah, so. time passes, it does that. Well, thank you both for coming in and contributing to our Second Space uh, extravaganza tonight. Thank you. You're Can welcome. I just say one more thing? Absolutely. Because you mentioned Sondheim um, before. Uh, the only musical I ever got to do at GCP was directed by Dan Pisano, and it was Sweeney Todd. Oh. And being involved, I was just in the chorus, but being involved in that show was just amazing. You know, that, that music and those lyrics, it was such a pleasure to get to be part of. I'm, gonna, I'm getting a little bit I know. Just it's, talking about it, but you know. I, um, when I was writing the story that I was so talking much. about, you know, a few minutes ago, it was um, surprisingly emotional. And I had my, my headphones on and I got on Apple Music and just started putting in Sondheim songs and just thinking, my God, this guy was brilliant. Yeah, he's amazing. Just what a turn of, of, of phrase. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, so uh, Months on End runs from January 7th to February 27th, and you can find more details at gcplayers.com. Coming up next, Aiden Pertel is 16 years old and plays the piano and he's really good. So good, in fact, that his piano teacher, Andreas Wirtz, asked him to perform a special concert on January 9th for the Philip Lorenz International Keyboard Concert Series at Fresno State. This series features world-famous pianists, and an invitation to someone so young is rare. CMAC producer Kyle Lowe and I caught up with Aidan Pertel at the piano, of course. Here's our story. is thinking about one date right now, January 9th. Tell us, Aiden, what's so special about January 9th? Well, I'm making my professional debut at the Keyboard Concert Series as a special event. It's always been a big dream of mine, and now it's finally coming true. Now, how old are you? I'm 16 years old. So you're 16 years old, and you're going to be playing a full-length concert at this this world-renowned uh, piano series. That's a pretty big deal, right? It's a huge deal. I'm very excited and a little nervous. I was gonna ask you, do you get nervous before a concert? Uh, always, and it's a good thing in a way because it helps you focus, um, but on the other side, you have to control it because you don't want it to become a distraction. You will be uh, performing some really interesting works, and we're gonna to get to that in a moment, but. First, let's talk a little bit about your background. How old were you when you started playing piano? Um, well, I started playing the piano at age six and a half, but I started my music instruction at five. So when my grandfather's father was five, uh, he had my grandfather uh, play the ukulele. So when I turned five, my grandfather wanted me to play the ukulele. 
So I took uh, ukulele lessons at Patrick's Music for about a year. And whenever I had a question, uh, the instructor who had a piano in the room would always say, well, I can't show you on the ukulele, but I can show you on the piano. So eventually I asked, well, just teach me how to play the piano. And since then, it's been a great journey, challenging journey, but exciting journey. Well, first of all, I didn't even know you could take ukulele lessons, so that's a great <laughs> that's a great thing to know. Um, and secondly, that is really amazing that you knew what you wanted to do from such an early age. So you you started taking piano lessons, and then when you were nine years old, you started taking lessons with someone who was has been very important in your life. Tell us who that is. Andreas Wirtz. And Andreas is of course the artistic director of keyboard concerts, um, a professor of piano at Fresno State, a great pianist in his own right. What was it like uh, to audition for him or to play for him the first time? Uh, so when I played for him the first time, um, I was nine, as I said before, and I played the third movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Now it's a very, very challenging piece and it was completely above my level. Um, so when I was finished, he said, bravo, uh, but please never do that again. <laughs> so in other words, he, he wants you to, to wait a while until- Wanted me to wanted wait a you while. Wanted you to yeah. wait a while. Mm -hmm. um, but that was pretty daring of you to play such a difficult piece for him. It was, it was very daring, yeah. What, what does having a teacher like Andreas, what does it mean to you? Does, is, it, is it in terms of him t showing you various technique or is it kind of as a coach encouraging you? What, what does he bring to the equation? Well, I think Andreas does a lot of things um, and I'm very grateful for all the work he's done for me. Um, of course, he always has to work with me with technique. It's a continuing uh, journey there. Um, but he has the most incredible insights uh, about the interpretation of the music. He's has played in many halls. Uh, he's listened to a lot of music, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, he can pull from his tremendous wealth of experience and share me share with me things that I could never have dreamed of on my own. Now you go to Clovis Online School. You're going to be graduating from from high school early. What has that arrangement meant for you in terms of your practicing and your ability to focus on the piano? Well, uh, first of all, I have more time to practice and I can practice in the morning, which is when, generally speaking, your concentration is the best. Um, it's also allowed me to have much more flexibility when I'm uh, at a competition or a performance or a festival I have to go to. Um, and of course, uh, the timing was impeccable. Like three months after I started the Clovis Online, COVID hit. So um, I was situated perfectly to deal with the pandemic. You mentioned competitions. And my understanding is that the, the piano world is very geared toward competitions in terms of younger people. It's kind of a way that you prove yourself. T tell us about that, that competitive world and what, what have you excelled at so far? Uh, well, first of all, it's very fierce competition. Um, there are a lot of pianists who are very, very good from all over the world. Um, it is actually a very fast growing industry in China, Japan, and South Korea. A large number of pianists who have techni or technically perfect. So um, they end up putting a lot of competitions. In the end, um, they're not something that I particularly like but they do push me, and that's really a good thing in the end. And you've done um, very well at a couple of them. Tell, tell us what, what those have been. Yes, I was a participant at the Philadelphia International Piano Competition this past summer. It was exciting. Um, I also won the Music Teachers Association of California uh, Concerto Competition. So that was another big, exciting thing for me. And you've also been to Germany to, to play there? Yes. Um, about four years ago, my family and I took a big trip to Europe. We, uh, Germany, Italy, uh, Switzerland, France. It was fantastic. It was un really unbelievable. Um, and I got to go to Andreas's house in Germany. And he lives in this little village outside of Frankfurt. 
So I got to play a concert in his house uh, with the whole village watching. So it was pretty cool. How fun. I've always wondered, like, where does Andres live? You know, what, what, what is his place like? So um, we'll have to see some pictures of that someday. <laughs> so so um, tell us about this concert on January 9th. You've been preparing for it. Um, what can people expect? Uh, well, I think all the repertoire is completely out of the ordinary. Um, I'm starting with a piece by the American composer, Morton Gould. It's called Ghost Waltzes. So it synthesizes these sort of jazz waltzes, Chopin waltzes, Viennese Strauss waltzes, um, and then atonal American waltzes, and puts that into this sort of this really crazy piece. It was the uh, commission piece for the uh, 1992 Clyburn competition. So it's played a lot then, not so much now, uh, but it's a great opener. After that, I'll be playing Beethoven's Opus 7 Sonata, which is one of the rarely played sonatas, and then Stravinsky's own arrangement of uh, Petrushka, the ballet. And then in the second half, I'll be doing uh, Brahms' second piano sonata, which is a, a very exciting piece that he wrote when he was two years older than me. Mm. There's a pretty cool connection there to play a piece that I mean, someone who's basically your age wrote. I think it's pretty cool. Do you, how often do you practice or how much do you practice a day, uh, particularly for a, an event like this coming up? I typically practice six and a half hours a day. And you do that in the morning? Like, do you get up and run to the piano, or is it an afternoon, evening thing? Um, I split it up. So I do about four and a half hours in the morning and two in the evening. And you're also in the process because you're going to be graduating from high school in, I guess, June. Uh, you're applying to conservatories uh, across the country. Uh, yes, I've been applying uh, to conservatories and universities across the country. Um, if all goes well, I'll get invitations to auditions in the spring. Um, and if that goes well, I'll, I'll get into a few places and I'll have a choice, which is very exciting. Well, that, that'll be fantastic. And of course, you have to keep us posted on that and let us, let us know um, what, what ends up, what happens. I want to ask you just about what it's like to play the piano and play these works that are just incredibly complex. Do you, um, do you feel like you almost lose yourself in a piece? Where's your brain when you're playing? Um, all right, so my brain is basically focused on two things. Uh, one is going to be just getting the technical aspects uh, down, the right notes, making it clear, et cetera. Um, and then the other half is going to be trying to create an emotion with the music, which is really what music is all about. It's mm -hmm. about emotion. Um, so depending on the difficulty of the piece and the texture, I probably go back and forth between those two. And are you thinking ahead, or is part of your brain thinking ahead? It's like, oh, this really tough piece is, part of the piece is coming up, and I, I need to do this and this and this, or does it all just kind of flow in a, in a line? Uh, it should flow. If you're nervous about a particular spot, that's not good. You, yeah. Well, thank you, Aiden, for, for uh, taking time from your busy uh, practice schedule uh, to, to fill us in on, on this concert. Um, and I understand that you're going you're gonna to play an excerpt yes. from one of your pieces. I'm going to be playing the uh, first movement of Brahms' Opus 2 piano sonata. Well, great. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. about two promising events for January, but I want to make sure I get in a word about the holidays as well. Continuing our second space theme, I get to interview four actors in the very popular Holly Jolly Holidays show, which runs through December 19th. And better yet, we're going to get to hear them sing. Let's welcome Janet Glade, Dory and Kaylin Sanders, and Chloe Dumore. Thank you all. 
Merry Christmas, happy Merry holidays, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. all that good stuff. So I have to say that I have this image of a Christmas show like yours as when you walk backstage, it's suddenly this winter wonderland of, you know, warm and fuzzy, you know, snowmen and treats <laughs> and globs of chocolate. Um, is it like that? Well, actually, right now we've started Secret Santas. Oh, okay. So there is lots of treats and things being passed around, you know, from Secret Santas. But it does seem like almost every night we go, there are cookies back there and treats that someone has has brought to share. But that's what I was figuring out is, yeah. is on the treats, and we'll talk about Janet's recipe in a second. Um, <laughs> so, Chloe, what what is this show? How do you describe uh, to your friends at school, for example? when you want to tell them what you're you're doing for two months? Um, it's a really fun, um, like, original work. We do a lot of comedy sketches and songs and Christmas carols, some, some old stuff, some familiar stuff, and then some stuff that people haven't heard before. So it's really fun. It's really festive. And Kaylin, what are a couple of these um, fun sketches? Some of the fun sketches we do are we do a tap challenge between elves and reindeer. <laughs> and um, there's a Christmas carol sketch where the audience gets to participate. There's a Secret Santa sketch, which is so much fun because the audience gets to join our Secret Santa for a night and just like fun little sketches like that. So we are in December now, so you've played to a lot, a lot of houses. Do you notice a difference between those audiences from the first part of the run the audience is now? Yes, definitely. Are they in a much, in a, they're more festive moods? I think so. I mean, we opened before Halloween, so those audiences were maybe not into it as much as they are now. We're coming, you know, in their Christmas gear and ready to sing those Christmas carols along with us. But, you know, that's what actors <clears throat> do all the time, right? Is they, we were talking about how they will film like those Netflix movies or all those episodes of sitcoms that have a Christmas theme, and they're probably filmed in May, April, you know, July, that, that kind of thing. How, how do you get in the mood yourself, Dory? Well, it took a little bit of time, because at our house, our rule is we don't sing or listen to Christmas music until after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So for us to, you know, start in September, um, we did it because that's what you do as an actor, you know? So we learn it and we do it and we listen to it and listen to it. So it got us into the mood earlier than, than normal for sure. But it was, we'd always joke about, oh, we gotta do the Christmas stuff and it's, you know, October. <laughs> but you do it, it's fun. So Janet, I understand that you actually share a recipe in this show. What, what is that dish? It's, it's kind of making me hungry, just thinking about <laughs> what it's going to be. Well, it's, uh, it's sweet potato pie, mm. and it's my mom's recipe, which she made from scratch, and it was just, it, you know, a lot of people have a dish or some, something at Christmas time or Thanksgiving where they just love for their, their mom to make it, and I just, that's just, I don't know, it's just one of those dishes that I just, thought, I'm going to have to remember how to make this because she had she didn't have a recipe. So I had to sit there, okay, what is she putting in now? What is she doing? How much of that? You know? And so I, I share this story about that uh, in the show. And I actually did bring some sweet potato pie to share with the cast. So And, and they, I hear it was gobbled up oh, like... They loved it. Yes, it was delicious. Like they loved it. Was it? Right? Yes. yes. <laughs> I was surprised because I didn't know. Highest you know. rating, so. <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. know they were going to love it that much. Okay. You know, so I'm going to bring some more. Yay. Yeah, for them. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's let's check in with our younger cast members. Um, Chloe, tell tell us what other shows have you done for GCP? Well, a few years back, I did a second space show. I did Brighton Beach Memoirs. I played Lori, and um, that was a good like family show. I did that with my actual sister. She was my stage sister, and then um, right before. Um, 2020, when everything got shut down, I was in Elf at um, GCP. Mm -hmm. That was super fun. Another Christmas show. <laughs> that sounds great. How about you, Kaylin? Um, in 2018, I was Kate and Annie. And in 2019, I was in the ensemble of Hairspray and the ensemble of Newsies. And right as everything got shut down, I was one of the kids in The King and I. Oh, yeah. The King and I. We didn't get to see The King and I. No. Uh, and then three of you were actually in this this recent 
special show, the All Together Now, that you did with um, GCP's alum, uh, Chris Colfer. What, what was that like? Janet, I understand your rehearsal schedule must have been crazy. Oh my God, we were, we were actually doing shows, Holly, the Holly Jolly Show, so where on the weekends we, uh, we started rehearsing for All Together Now, and uh, it's like you're trying to fit all of this in, and you're wondering, is it all gonna come together? What's, what's it gonna look like? Is it gonna be okay? But everything came together, and, and the sh I thought the show was fantastic. Oh, I think it was too. So, it yeah. was, and it was fun actually to see you all on a big stage. Uh, I realized that I was so used to watching GCP. You know, y you have to like shrink down for your <laughs> stage, and so to be able to see some space between you—that was that was kind of fun. Um, and Kaylin, what was it like working with Chris Colfer? It was so amazing. We were so excited to get to work with him, and he was super nice and. It was just so much fun. And were you a big Glee fan? Before? I've never watched you Glee, never watched but it. I've read all of the books he's wrote, so okay. I'm a big fan of him. Okay. So we have a special privilege tonight of getting to hear you sing a couple songs uh, from the show. Uh, tell us, Janet, can you tell us about uh, the first song? The first song is uh, Do You Hear What I Hear? And one of the Christmas songs we sing in Holly Jolly, and I believe they're going to be singing some backup for me okay, <laughs> for that okay. song. So. And when you perform Christmas songs in your show, do you sense from the audience like there are certain ones that they are really, like they really warm to it really quickly? Definitely. We'll hear them singing along. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, there is a section in the show where we ask them to sing along, but there are definitely times when we don't ask them to sing along <laughs> when they're singing with us. So we know that they're definitely enjoying, you know, what they're what they're hearing. It's one of those things that it's a ritual. It's something that, you know, we grow up with, and it's really nice to be able to have some continuity <laughs> in our lives. Yes. And then uh, Chloe, for the second song. Tell us about that. Uh, the second song is Silent Night, and we are doing sign language. Me and Kaylin were performing the sign language for it, and that's one that we encourage the audience to sing along with. Okay. Was that hard for you to learn how to do that for the show, or had you already did you already know how to do sign language? No, we didn't know any, but I think we learned it pretty fast. Yeah. We had our stage manager teach us. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Well, we are really looking forward to that. And just a reminder that uh, your show runs through December 19th. December 19th. So there's still some performances uh, you can catch. And it actually must be really fun that last weekend as well, because you're really getting close to the, to the to real Christmas, thing. Yes. <laughs> and even like in the Sanders household, it, you're totally allowed to Absolutely. be totally, yes. Yes. totally Everyone, Christmas. Yes, totally at Christmas the top out. of their lungs every day. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here, and I really look forward to hearing you sing. When we come back from the break, two Christmas tunes from our guests. And now, the cast of Good Company's Holly Jolly Holidays. <laughs> Said the night wind to the little lamb, Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb, Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. With a tail as big as a kite Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy Do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? Ringing through the sky, shepherd boy Do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? A song, a song High above the trees with a voice as big as the sea, with a voice as big as the sea. Said the shepherd boy to the mighty king, do you know what I Shivers in the cold. 
cold, let us bring him silver and gold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Said the king to the people everywhere, listen to what I Thank you so, so much. Come on, Dan. Come on, you can do it. Let's, let's get Dan Pisano on scene yes. now. Yes. Well, that wraps it up for this month's episode of the Monroe Review. Be sure to keep up online at MonroeReview.com for previews, giveaways, profiles, reviews, and more. A big thank you to our volunteer crew. Thank you. And a thank you to all our guests, Brian Beckstrand, Tracy Hostmeyer, Aiden Pertel, Janet Glade, Dory and Kaylin Sanders, and Chloe Dumore. And for all of you, please keep exploring and supporting the local art scene. We'll see you next time. Thank you.